Good evening, everyone. I'm WFA meteorologist Kyle Roberts. I want to bring you an update on Milton, what the latest with the storm is and where it is headed. We're going to talk about some of the records that Milton has set as well and how it compares to some historic storms that we've had, not only in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, but out in the Atlantic as well. We're recording this about 640 in the evening on Tuesday. Uh, more updates will happen as we head through the evening, but just giving you kind of the timeline for what we know as of right now and what we know going forward. I don't expect a ton in the way of changes if you're watching this a little bit after that, but um, just to give you an idea of when we are recording uh, this uh, update for you. So here's Milton at the moment. It was a Category 4 storm earlier today, re-intensified into a Category 5 storm, and that's where it is at the moment. You can see just the eye of that storm. When you get just that picture-perfect eye of a hurricane like that, I mean, that just tells you it is a very powerful storm. Pretty big storm as well for a Category 5 storm at the moment. I mean, just a absolute, I mean, it's a beautiful storm. The problem is, is it's going to be a destructive storm because at the moment it's not destructive. It's just out over the uh, Gulf of Mexico, some probably storm surge and some gusty winds along parts of the Yucatan Peninsula there, but at least it's, it is moving away from the Yucatan. Uh, the worst of the storm obviously right there in the center, and that's just out in the Gulf of Mexico, but once it moves closer to land and once, once it moves onshore to Florida, that's where the real damage, at least in the U.S., will start to occur. So there's expanding the view back out right now. There's Tampa. That's where the storm is headed here over the next 24 hours or so, set to make landfall sometime late Wednesday night, maybe even more so early to, uh, Thursday morning, depending on how you want to look at it. But as I mentioned, at the time of recording, Category 5 storm with wind speeds of 165 miles an hour, gusting to 200, moving east-northeast at close to 10 miles an hour. At the moment, it's about 475 miles to the southwest of Tampa, and it's basically going to move due northeast toward the Tampa area, making a landfall probably end up being just south of Tampa at the moment. Here's the projected track for that storm uh, at the moment. It, the center of the storm can make landfall anywhere between, remember the, the cone is actually where the center of the storm could make landfall. It's not where the edges of the storm. We put the center line on there to just kind of give you an idea of where the most likely area for the storm to make landfall is. But in all actuality, what the cone means is that the center of the storm could make landfall anywhere within that cone and that would be an accurate forecast at the moment the top edge of the cone just north of tampa bottom edge of the cone just south of uh, fort myers really kind of through fort myers at the moment with kind of the most likely landfalling location south of immediate tampa bay probably in and around the sarasota area now if you're looking closely you notice that it was category 5 storm while we're recording this but when it's making landfall tomorrow night down to a category three storm with wind speeds of 125 miles an hour. Now that sounds good and, and it's it, it's not a bad thing that the wind speeds are decreasing as the storm gets closer to landfall. But in reality, because of how strong the storm is right now and what I'm going to show you here in a second is a lot of times when these extremely strong storms like we have right now, when they start to weaken, at least in terms of wind speed, they actually start to grow in size and those strong winds can actually affect a larger area than when they are very strong. And also that can make a uh, big impact on how widespread the significant storm surge is going to be as well. Just to give you an idea, 85 mile an hour winds, even as it's moving off the east coast of Florida. So it's gonna be between a category three and a category one, one to two, as it moves across central Florida. That's all the wind that's going to move through across central Florida as well. Widespread power outages, widespread trees down anywhere from Orlando to Fort Pierce, Fort Myers, Sarasota, Tampa, anybody within that central Florida area reemerges out over the Atlantic as a uh, continues to be a hurricane. And then eventually it'll move out into the open Atlantic, uh, weakening to tropical storm and then kind of becomes just what we call an extra tropical low pressure system. Will not make a second landfall in the U.S. or anything like that. Definitely the most significant uh, problems with this storm will be in the state of Florida. And by the way, the areas of Georgia, the areas of Tennessee, the areas of uh, North Carolina and South Carolina that were so severely affected by Helene will not be affected by Milton. However, areas like Tampa, which did see significant storm surge from Helene, will see Obviously, significant impacts, kind of a one-two punch there for the Tampa area with Helene and Milton. But this storm a long way away from the areas of Georgia, Tennessee, the Carolinas that were severely have affected by Helene. Good news for them. Bad news, obviously, for the state of Florida. Here's the computer models for you. 
very easily projected to move through the central part of Florida, a tight clustering of those models. But where the center of the storm makes landfall, remember the cone I was showing you earlier, basically the range of models are kind of the, how wide that forecast cone was there. Where the exact center of the storm makes landfall will affect who sees some of the highest storm surge because the way a hurricane rotates, the highest storm surge kind of along the right side of the path of the storm. However, I will say if you know wherever the storm ends up making landfall, if you're just to the left of the center of the storm, those areas are going to see significant storm surge as well. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that typically the worst of the storm surge kind of on the, uh, the right side of the storm, just the way, the, uh, the way that the wind and the way that the storm uh, spirals around and uh, affects the land as that wind and waves and all that move on shore there. I want to take you back to the storm at the moment, talk about the wind speeds. So here's the wind speeds contained within the storm right now. But I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of all the winds that aren't 74 miles an hour or higher. Now, 74 miles an hour or higher makes a storm a hurricane. Once the wind speeds are 75 miles an hour or 74 miles an hour, that makes a storm a hurricane. So the winds within this that are hurricane strength or stronger within Milton are about 60 miles wide at the moment, 60 miles wide. But as that storm gets closer to Florida, you can really see how wide that hurricane force wind is going to become. That's what I was talking about. So even though the actual wind speeds within the storm are going to drop. They're not going to drop below 74 miles an hour. Remember category three, about 125 miles an hour is it making landfall. But the diameter at its widest of how you kind of the width of those 74 plus mile an hour winds more than doubles in size as it gets closer to Florida. And that's why more wind speeds are going to, or more areas of Florida are going to be significantly impacted by wind. And also that storm surge is going to be very significant for right around the Tampa area, Sarasota area, where it's 10 to 15 feet of storm surge. That's 10 to 15 feet above ground level. So you're standing on the ground. Imagine 10 to 15 feet of water above your head. That's what Tampa to Sarasota will be dealing with. Outside of that, Fort Myers can expect about six to 10 feet. A little north of Tampa, about five to 10 feet. Cedar Key, it's about three to five feet. South Florida, not as much. Marco Island could still see four to seven, but once you head into South Florida, it's three to five feet. Uh, Miami area, not expected to see any storm surge. And the popular vacation destinations, Panama City, 30A, that part of Florida will not be affected by Milton at all. But Tampa, Orlando won't see storm surge because it's inland, but Orlando definitely will get its fair share of wind and its fair share of rain, which I'll show you here in a second. Now remember that storm is going to move out over the Atlantic as we head into uh, kind of the late week time frame, and then the winds will be from this direction, kind of from the east, pushing water on shore to the eastern coast of Florida, and that's where you could see three to five feet of storm surge kind of on the back side of this storm from Melbourne to T Daytona Beach and all the way up to Jacksonville. That's why hurricane warnings are in effect for basically that whole area, which includes Tampa, includes inland areas like Orlando. So, you know, Disney and all the uh, properties surrounding that. And then also the other popular, uh, you know, vacation destinations, all the parks that are in the Orlando area as well. I mean, you're going to see a lot of wind and a lot of rain with this storm. Basically during the day on Thursday is when the storm will be trekking across the central part of Florida. Outside of that, we have tropical storm warnings, which basically just which extend all the way down to South Florida, all the way up to Jacksonville, including J Gainesville, which basically means you're going to see uh, more tropical storm conditions versus hurricane conditions uh, with the storm. It's not that the storm is going to weaken to a tropical storm. It just means that the conditions will be more like a tropical storm. Here's the rainfall projections. Tampa to Orlando, 12 to 16 inches of rain. Isolated totals up to 18 inches, 8 to 12 inches outside of that. But rainfall really tapers off pretty quickly north and south of the center part of the storm. In fact, by the time you get down toward Miami, it's not a whole lot in the way of rain. But remember, that's just rainfall. That's not storm surge. That's rainfall. So there will be inland flooding uh, with Milton as well. Let's take you back. Remember we talked about Milton being a category five storm at the moment. Let's talk about some of the records that Milton has set since 1979. It is the fourth lowest pressure in the Atlantic that happened on Monday when it intensified to those wind speeds up to 180 miles an hour, technically at a, at a, a central low pressure of 897 millibars. That's how we measure pressure. That was the fourth lowest pressure 
from since 1979 with storms in the Atlantic. Since 1966, it's the strongest storm in the Gulf of Mexico this late in the season with wind speeds of 180 miles an hour. And since 1950, it's one of only three storms in the Gulf with wind speeds of 180 miles an hour. So definitely a very strong storm, no matter how you measure it. And in the top kind of criteria, you know, top tier of uh, hurricanes that we've ever recorded in not only the Gulf of Mexico, but the Atlantic as well. And only five storms in the Atlantic have been stronger than Milton. The strongest storm in the Atlantic on record was Allen, which had wind speeds only 10 miles an hour stronger uh, than Milton with 190 mile an hour wind speeds. And, and Allen, by the way, happened back in 1980. There you go. I, I listed out here the strongest hurricanes in the Atlantic Basin on record. You have Allen in 1980, wind speeds of 190. You have the Labor Day hurricane in 1935, Gilbert in 1988, Dorian in 2019, and Wilma in 2005 all had wind speeds of 185 miles an hour. Then you have Milton, which starts the list of storms with 180 miles an hour. You also have Mitch in 1998, Rita in 2005, Irma in 2017, and then you have Katrina and nine other storms that also had wind speeds of 175 miles an hour. So that's kind of the top 10 list, if you will, of the strongest storms that we've ever recorded in the Atlantic. And a reminder, category five storms are wind speeds 170, uh, 157 miles an hour or, or higher is when it becomes a category five storm. And we rank hurricanes on something called the Saffir Simpson scale they become a hurricane with wind speeds of 74 miles an hour. Category one ends at 95, then category two, three, four. You get the idea with what we just talked about. Category five being wind speeds of 157 miles an hour or stronger. Why is there not a category six? Well, to be honest with you, when you have wind speeds of 157 miles an hour, it really doesn't matter how much stronger the wind is for that, for what the damage and the, and, and the impacts of that storm. Winds could be 160 miles an hour, winds could be 180 miles an hour, winds could be 200 miles an hour. It really doesn't matter. 157 is enough to cause significant, significant catastrophic damage if that's the intensity of the storm as it, or the, uh, the strength of the storm as it makes landfall. So if the winds are 157 or 180, it's not going to make a difference for, for the destruction and the, that's going to happen with the storm. So there's no need for there to be a category six. I mean, yes, there, as I just showed you on that list, there are quite a few storms that are much stronger than 157. But like I said, there's no need for, the, for a category six because 157 is plenty high for the destruction uh, to occur within that storm. So there, there's, there's no need for there to be a category six uh, criteria. This is different. Just, to, just kind of an aside here, this is different than how we rank tornadoes. Tornadoes are rated on EF scale is what we call that, and they're based on damage, not based on wind speed. So you can't rank a tornado or rate a tornado while it's occurring. You have to wait until afterwards you do a damage survey, figure out how strong the wind speeds were in that tornado. We don't have a really a uh, accurate way to measure wind speeds in a tornado in real time. There's, there's some radar data that can be done to do that, uh, but it's not necessarily 100% accurate. And so it's just easier to rate tornadoes after they've occurred by going and doing damage surveys. Hurricanes, however, we can drop uh, instruments down into the hurricanes and we can get a pretty good idea of how strong they are and how strong their wind speeds are. So that's why we are able to rate hurricanes on a scale of one to five by their wind speed before they made landfall or, or while they're going on, obviously. All right, back to Milton out into the Gulf of Mexico. Here it is spinning at the moment. A reminder, this has been an update a little before seven o'clock uh, central time on your Tuesday evening. I uh, just wanted to give you the latest on that and kind of some records that Milton has set and where it is headed. I hope you have a great evening. If you're watching from the state of Florida, um, I'm definitely keeping you in my thoughts uh, over the next several days. I hope uh, that you've taken all the necessary precautions that you can. I hope everybody has a good evening and uh, bears the storm uh, as much as you can. For those of you watching from afar that are not in the state of Florida, remember to keep the, those folks in Florida in your thoughts and prayers, as well as those still recovering from Helene and parts of Georgia, the Carolinas and Tennessee as well. Once again, my name is Meteor uh, Kyle Roberts, meteorologist here at WFA. Have a good evening, everybody.